So we we talk a lot about about Christianity around here, being that that's our kind of our thing. But like, what what is what does it mean to live that out? What does the Christian life actually look like, right? Because we can talk about what Christianity is in terms of like theological concepts, like Christianity is about following Christ, it's about these things. But day by day, we have to live this out. So what does that look like every day? Is it because coming to church on Sunday isn't a full life, right? That's one seventh of your life. Does it does it mean supporting the right causes? Does it mean boycotting the right products? Does it mean eating a Chick Fil A once a week? What is, what does the Christian life actually look like when you live it out? And so, this is important for us to really nail down because the thing is that we are made to be in relationship with God, and relationship is ongoing. It's all the time, and this is whether you are a Christian or not. This is what we're made for. And so, if we are a Christian, we believe we've entered into that relationship. And if if we're not a Christian, then then we need to know what that looks like to enter into that relationship. And so living this out every day is something that, that I, I really want us to talk about today. And so I'm going to be going to Jude. Uh, we're actually going to be at the end of Jude, starting in verse 20. But real quick, since this isn't exactly part of a series, let me just set it up. Jude wanted to write to some people in the church about, their, about salvation, but a situation arose where they had some false teachers. So he wrote to them and said, okay, I want to write about salvation, and maybe at some point I will, but first, oh my God, guys, what are you doing? You have these people in your congregation, they're teaching these things, we need to deal with it. He tells them how to recognize it, he tells them how to deal with it, and going through this whole thing, at the end, he says, okay, now that we've addressed that, here's what you need to be. So starting in verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit... Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So what do we get from this? Well, we, I, I'm gonna, I argue that we get three broad concepts of what the Christian life looks like from this text. All right, so the first is that the Christian life is a life of growth. All right, verses 20 to 21, he's talking about walking with God. He's talking about growing in this relationship, right? Building yourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. This thing, this is what this is kind of basic aspects of what growing in this relationship looks like and on a on a daily living, right? And you see this in basically any relationship, right? So I'm married, I, I have I have this wife, and I what would I like to think that our relationship is growing. But it would be really hard to argue that it was growing, right, if I'm not communicating with her on a regular basis. If I'm not, you know, if my love for her isn't growing and developing as time goes on and as we learn more each other and as we deal with things more often. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense for me to say that our relationship is growing if I'm making decisions that don't consider her, right? If I'm sitting here going, oh, okay, yeah, well, I'm in no way to do this thing. I never think about what impact that's going to have on her or on the kids, or on our household, or on our marriage. If I don't, if I'm not looking at this thing that we have, and making judgments in light of that, and growing in our love, and communicating these things to each other, then that relationship isn't going to grow. And it's the same with any relationship, and it's the same with our relationship with God. Right? And so we get a little bit of information from uh, actually a different verse, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, a, a little bit about what it is that we're growing into, right? Peter tells us that we are living stones being built into a spiritual house. He calls us a holy priesthood that is making spiritual sacrifices. These are big ideas. These are complex things. These are, these are heavy. This idea of, of being built into something much larger than ourselves. And we're not going to get there if we're not doing these things that Jude is telling us to do. Being in prayer. Uh, gauging our lives through the lens of our salvation. You know, growing in this relationship, in this love. 
Now, some of the details, obviously, will happen naturally if we are doing those things. If we're hearing God's word, if we're applying it, if we are going to him in prayer, if we're listening for what he says to us, and then actually try to do that, some of the stuff is going to happen naturally. We're going to grow in love. We're going to be looking at our salvation more often. But one of the big things that we have to do on a day-by-day basis is actually make decisions about things that are happening around us and gauge those decisions based on how good of an idea they actually are. And doing that first set of things, the prayer, the growing in love, the, uh, the looking to our salvation to interpret our lives, right, is going to set us up to be able to do that because the Christian life is a life of discernment. These are the next two verses, verses 22 and 23 here, where he says, And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Right? He wants us to act with understanding. Right? These are three very different reactions to things that are happening in the church that Jude is writing to. These are three very different reactions that we can have to things that are happening in our lives. And the point of it is that there's a broad array of things that we have to know when to do which one. Right? How do we know when to, when to uh, have mercy on some that are doubting. Well, we have to know that they're doubting. We have to know what that looks like. We have to understand these things. We have to listen. Right? How do we know who to hate to the point of even the garment touching the flesh? That's going to require a lot of discernment. Because if we, if we apply that one wrong, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. All right? And so this is, this is all about going to God and getting discernment and applying that discernment in our lives. And he's willing to tell us these things, right? He's willing to give us direction. He's willing to give us ideas on what types of things are good and what types of things aren't. In something of an extreme example, there was me coming to Massachusetts, right? I was invited to come to Massachusetts to help out with a church plant uh, back when I was living in PA. And I didn't want to for a number of reasons. Um, Largely, I thought it was a terrible idea. Secondly, I didn't like Massachusetts. But I, I just, I was invited to do this and I didn't want to do it. But I said, all right, fine, I'll ask. And so I prayed about it and I said, okay, God, if, if you really want me to go and do this crazy idea in this town I don't like, please let me know. All right? And I assure you, he took no hesitation in doing that. I, the reasons I didn't, the reason I wanted to stay there, whereas, you know, I was, in, I was engaged to this girl, and I finally got a nice, nice job, and I was looking at an apartment, and within about a week, all of those things were gone. It doesn't always have to be that extreme. I'm the sort of stubborn they write parables about, and so God has to use a hammer sometimes. But, like, he will answer these things. He'll give us some sort of guidance. He provides this way for us to know what sorts of things he wants us to do and how to interpret situations around us. Jude is relying on that when he tells us this. He, having been talking about false teachers, he's, he's primarily concerned with how well they interpret that. But this applies to everything. How we understand the world around us, how we interpret the things that are happening, and how we re- know how to respond to that is a matter of discernment. And the Christian life should be marked by wise discernment. Because we have access to the God who knows everything. So we need to be praying about that. We need to be going to him. So how do we, how do, we do that? What is, remember that, as I said, the reason that we can do that is that we have access to the God who knows everything, right? Because the Christian life is a life centered on God, is the third point. Verses 24 through 25, right? This kind of benediction where he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Right? This is all of this. The point of the Christian life is not to live a Christian life. It is to glorify God and be relying on his power. The point of the Christian life is that we are walking in a way that God is glorified in everything that we do, and that we cannot do it without God. Right? I don't know if they still use him, but the Energizer Bunny, basically everybody knows who the Energizer Bunny is, right? The Energizer Bunny exists for one purpose. The Energizer Bunny exists to showcase how amazing Energizer batteries are. That's his purpose. Walking around, banging on the drums, spinning around, all of that stuff. 
It's all secondary. The point of him is to glorify these batteries. And we know, we know by looking at him, at least, you know, when I was growing up, when it was a literal physical bunny that was moving around on set, that he's not going to do anything without that battery. He's incapable of anything. You take that battery away, and it's just a dead piece of plastic with pink fur. And the, there is a certain point to which this, is, this should be our lives, should be marked in the same way. We exist to be glorifying God. The things that we're doing point to God. We are honoring God. We are pointing to him. We are showcasing his glory. And it should be apparent to the people in our lives that if there is not God acting through us, none of it would work. We're done. Is this the life that we're living? Because all of our glory belongs to God, right? Nothing that we do should be about us. It should be glorifying God. And so this whole benediction, he's talking about how all of this is to God's glory and relying on God's power. Because we can lean on God to do these things in our lives. We can trust him to act in our lives, right? The aim, if the aim of our lives is to glorify him, we can lean on him to trust it for the power to do that. Because God promises to do this work in us. Right? He promises throughout Scripture, over and over again, that He's going to finish the work that He started in us. That He's going to mature us, that He's going to grow us. He is divine, and we are the branches. We grow through Him. And so we can rely on Him to do that. The Bible does use that type of language quite a lot. It uses maturity language. It talks about growing. It talks about you know, we need to give you milk. You should be having meat by now. But a child's growth necessarily means that they are growing in communication, that they're beginning to resemble their parents more, right? They begin to learn how to make their own decisions. They learn what they can and cannot rely on as foundations of their lives. My own kids, right? My son is still trying to figure out how to talk. And we're watching this communication growing. And he's, you know, right now it's to a stage where he can say some things, but he still has to, you know, babble a bit. And we ask, well, what do you want? And he'll have to physically walk us to the kitchen and point to it. But he's learning how to communicate. And this is growing. And by the time he's my daughter's age, he's going to be able to have full sentences that we'd rather he not say. But, like, this is a thing that's going to happen. This is how people mature. And this is how we need to mature in Christ. That we are... We are learning to communicate more, that we are learning to reflect him more, that we are making wise decisions as we understand more of the world through the God who knows all of it. And that we recognize that this, this God can be the foundation of our lives. This God is someone we can rely on. This God is someone that we can trust, that we can build our lives on, that we can glorify him. By leaning on him, we can live, lead a life that glorifies him. And by doing so, fulfill the point of our very existence. To be in relationship with him and to glorify him to the world around us. Because what he said he would do, he's going to do. And so if you, if you know this God, if you are already in relationship with this God, I would urge you to go to him to lean on him, to start relying on him, to carry out this work in your life. And if you don't know him today, I would ask you, what are you leaning on? Is it stable? Is it going to last? Because this will, this God will. He can do the thing that he says he's going to do. And you can come to him today, and you can reach out to him and ask him to do that in your life. And he will finish the work that he begins. Thank you.